Uh, I'm not Nancy Silover. <laughs> She'll follow me shortly. My name's Scott McClintock. I'm a graduate uh, student at ASU. I'm in the PhD program. And I may be the poster child for transdisciplinarity at the School of Sustainability. I have an MBA and a two-decade career in professional business selling uh, in the consumer goods industry. And I was drawn to scientific communication right out of the box. So uh, my interest resides in the area where we do advocate. And a lot has been said about that. And I'll only say this is that, in my view, when your audience thinks you're advocating, then you are. So the bad news is, welcome to sales. And the good news is, there's an entire body of knowledge out there that can be helpful. So, but enough said about that. Uh, what I want to talk about and what we want to talk about is that uh, ASU has developed under the Walton Initiative the uh, Center for Integrated Solutions to Climate Challenges. And so we want to tell you about the work we're doing there, which is to translate science into plain vanilla English. And what I want to do is just basically set the table, and none of these slides will be a surprise to you, but things to keep in mind as we move forward. Uh, this quote was taken from the NRC a few years ago, and we think it provides us a nice core ideology for our organization. Communication between scientists and decision makers has always been a challenge, and then I'll just jump to the bottom. Before we can convey our information, it needs to be synthesized and integrated so that relevant facts can be communicated in a useful form. So that kind of tells you what we're about and what we're trying to do. Uh, you've seen this slide before, and with apologies to those who developed it, uh, I show it only to tell you this is the lake we're swimming in when we try to communicate with practitioners and decision makers. And our professionals in urban planning and water planning mostly reside on the left-hand side of this lake. And so the dialogue that we attempt to undertake frequently looks like this. Uh, when we talk about climate science, it's rather complex, and we try to put that into some sort of uh, linear language and transmit that, and uh, our audience develops some sort of an idea. And it may be completely different from anything that we really intended. And frequently, no meaning is transferred whatsoever until there's some sort of visceral personal experience in the audience. And then, of course, we have the competing voices. And I just, you've probably all seen this. I just pulled it off of the internet. Um, per, uh, per draft AR5, climate models fail, spectacular miscalculation. All of our winters in the last 10 years have been cooler, by the way. And then it, it just you know, keeps crowding in until our climate dialogue is, is gone almost altogether. And again, this is the environment that we're working in. And so uh, we find in this environment public opinion waxes and wanes. Uh, here we see some of the recent Pew work that most of us should be familiar with. And there's an uptick to people who are willing to believe that uh, global warming is occurring. And still a minority believes that uh, humans have anything to do with it. Of course, there's an incredible political divide that uh, governs this. And I think one of the more uh, relevant pieces of information about this is this one, that those who consider this to be a serious problem is actually in a steady decline. And so as we deal with practitioners in our Center for Integrated Solutions to Climate Challenges, we find that what they want is simple, clear language, understandable, actionable, something that can be used for decision making. And we find that uh, the entry point tends to be the non-politicized things. And surprisingly, regional climate assessments in terms of uh, water runoff scenarios are, are entering that uh, arena, uh, surprisingly, because it has once been contested, and yet we find these people who have to now build 30-year runoff scenarios. They're coming to the very people frequently they may have criticized. And of course, urban heat island, things like that, uh, we have that visceral personal experience in many cases, which drives the need for actionable information. And so with that, I'll hand off to my colleague, Nancy Silover. Thank you very much. OK, thank you. Um, so we have set up the Center for Integrated Solutions to Climate Challenges. We're part of the Global Institute of Sustainability, and it's also, we're also part of the Walton Sustainability Solutions Initiatives. And um, climate change and responding and adapting to climate change is really a, a sustainability issue. So our mission is to provide integrated research-based decision tools and services aimed at management and planning challenges for urban decision makers in the face of climate change and uncertainty. So. 
we picked the urban heat island as our first issue. We have, we're almost in our uh, 20th year of drought, so water is a major issue. Um, we have one of the hottest cities in the United States. This is climate change now for the people that live there. Uh, we picked this because this is what the people locally want to know and want to be able to adapt to or mitigate and work on. That's their problem, and we want to be able to help them. Um, also, urban areas in arid regions are a very fast-growing type of urban area, so we think lessons learned and things we can develop here will be transportable to other places because ultimately we want to be global as well. Um, the urban heat island is not... Uh, has no political baggage. There's no one in the city of Phoenix that will argue with you that we have changed the climate in the city of Phoenix. Uh, it's just not going to happen. So what we have had is a rapid urbanization from a very small town in an irrigated agricultural area that's grown quite rapidly over the past uh, 100 years. And what happens is, as we've replaced these um, irrigated agriculture and natural desert surfaces with our urban pavements, we've increased our temperatures enormously, particularly our nighttime minimum temperatures. So we're now about 12 degrees or more warmer Fahrenheit than the surrounding rural, rural areas are at night. So we have a website. Um, it's, this is what it looks like. And what we've done is we've picked um, six sectors. We have health, water, uh, infrastructure, air quality, energy, and food systems. All of these sectors are impacted by climate. Um, and we also have climate up here at the top uh, because it's overarching over all of these. There's different impacts in each of these areas. And they also have impacts on each other. So one solution that we might come up with for dealing with energy may impact our water resources. And so these things are interconnected. Um, so we also want to give basic uh, climate science in very small bites that people can understand because we want to educate um, our stakeholders, the public, and the decision makers both. So we'll start with little things, graphic images and things like this in small bites um, to give them an idea of what goes on, why these things happen. So this is just diurnal heating over a dense urban surface versus over the natural or desert surface. You see we have uh, conduction into the uh, urban materials. So we have, um, it takes a lot longer for that heat to get out at night. Little things to help people understand kind of what's going on. The main focus of what we're doing, though, is with our researchers. We've had more urban heat island research done on the Phoenix metropolitan area than any other city in the world. Um, and yet, there it sits in journals, and no one reads it. So all of, the, all of the people in the city of Phoenix have no idea what we have learned about the urban heat island in Phoenix because they don't read the journal articles. And they don't read them because they're hard to understand and hard to access. So what we've done is we've taken those journal articles and we are sending them off to a science writer. And the science writer then translates um, that science and information into plain English that is understandable to everybody. Not dumbing it down, but just putting it in plain language. Because we all know sometimes it's really hard to wade through the stuff you get in journal articles. And part of that's because that's what the editors seem to want you to do. Anyway, so we take the script and summary. And we also gather images, graphs, um, maps, photos, uh, diagrams and things, and we send, put those together with the script and we send it back to the researcher for approval. Um, they're the main person. They did their research. We don't want to misstate what they did or their findings. We don't want to dumb it down and we don't want to overreach um, their conclusions. So once they've approved it or edited it and approved it, um, we generate a video. So it's a little talking head, like a TED talk. And so they um, do the narration and then behind that we have the images that happen that you can also watch as they go through the narration. We also ask them to uh, give us the assumptions for their research so that we know what those assumptions are. Uh, and we're asking them also to provide implications of the research from their point of view. Um, and the researchers that we have doing this, we have over 80 um, faculty at Arizona State University uh, affiliated with the Global Institute of Sustainability. And they are social scientists and physical scientists, a broad range of people. And uh, it's really important that we start with their peer-reviewed research. Beyond that, we'll be going on to um, co-generating knowledge with um, some of our stakeholders. So if you go to our website, um, there's the URL, uh, climate.asu.edu. Um, if you hover over any of these um, icons here, you will get uh, current science. You will get the latest TED Talk, the latest video um, by a researcher in that particular area. 
um, and this one in, is in health. Uh, Dr. Sharon Harlan's a social scientist. She looks at the heat island and how it deals with heat um, and health and vulnerable populations. And she's very concerned with um, environmental justice and social equity issues. So those are also part of her research. So she's looked at a bunch of neighborhoods around the metropolitan area. And she looks at the socioeconomic indicators as well as the climate indicators, the heat stress levels, what kind of landscaping they have, those sorts of things. And then, um, so as she would be talking here, you can also see what she's saying, and you can go and look through all of these little slides change. And you can always stop on one and say, I need more time looking at that. And you can pause her and come back to her later and things. We also have a place where you can ask the expert. So if you have a question for Sharon, you can enter it there, and uh, she'll get back to you. Um, and then um, we also have other tabs in that. That's the current science tab. We have science basics, things like some basic climate information. In this case, it would be basics about um, how climate can impact health. And it impacts it in a variety of ways. Um, and then we have uh, past trends and policies, planning information, economics. Um, all of our stakeholders that are the city managers and, and decision makers there always say, OK, well, you've told us what this problem is. We've defined it. You've given us a potential range of solutions for it. But what is it going to cost? And how long will it last? And so those are the other pieces of information that we have to provide to them. So we have to do economic analysis um, so that they'll know if they'll, what, how they want to use those potential solutions. Um, vulnerability analysis as well. So this is um, a new applied research paradigm for academics. Um, academics don't do so well usually with applied research. We're not a land-grant institution, so we don't have that tradition. We have working groups of researchers and stakeholders, and we match these teams with funding opportunities that come along. And decision uh, our stakeholders are driving the research and the methods of dissemination of the research. And you know um, NOAA and NIH, uh, um, NSF, are all requiring a a PI to be a stakeholder uh, on your project. And they also require you to specifically lay out exactly how you're going to disseminate the results and when, where the data are going to be and how they're going to be presented. So um, our stakeholders tend to drive this. Two issues that are a little thorny um, for us are, firstly, the reward system for the academic researchers. It's um, published in Nature and Science or the uh, top journal in your discipline. If, that's what, if you want to get tenure, that's what you need to do. Um, so we're working with the reward system. We have a lot of faculty who still want their stuff, even though it's already published in those. They still go the extra mile to get it out into the public and have it be used by decision makers. Um, the other thing is the time scales of research. The academics tend to go one to five years, depending on the grant or the project. Um, and the decision makers really are looking for three months, maybe, hopefully, nine months. We can stretch it out. Um, so that's also an issue. We have cross-sector challenges, and I'm not going to go into all of these. The easiest one to talk about is the water energy nexus. We can use water to apply to our landscape to cool naturally around our house, or we can consume water generating electricity and cool the house with air conditioning. Um, so somewhere there's an optimum use of both of those resources, and that's what we're, we're studying to find. We don't know the answer to that yet. Um, is this working? Uh, we're leveraging the Global Institute of Sustainability, all those faculty I talked about and their research, um, and the Sustainable Cities Network. Um, in, the, in the Phoenix metro area, there's um, almost every city has a sustainability officer. So they're looking towards sustainability, and they're looking for making their cities more efficient, and they're looking for us to try and help them find ways to do that. Um, the Walton Sustainability Solutions Initiatives has um, uh, an, uh, a solutions extension group, like Ag Extension. It's a sustainability extension. Um, they have um, a number of programs that, w that work with sustainability and, can, we can, and we can leverage here as well. We also have the National Engineering Center for Excellence, and they do things like um, permeable pavement research and cool roof and green roof studies and those sorts of things. So we employ those. And the, um, the uh, sustainability solutions people are helping us with actual projects with the city. They come to us looking for help in doing things like how do we lay out an urban forestry project if we want to add more shade trees. Um, do a greenhouse gas inventory, building efficiency studies, climate boot camps, um, green development along our light rail corridor, um, and, and making cool urban spaces um, and, and analyze how we can do that and what the, what the economics of that's going to be. And um, that's it.